understanding of the type of work that Andrew does um, and his team is, is really critical to advancing the Bitcoin network. And it's at a layer that, that a lot of us don't get to look through into every day. So we really appreciate Andrew being here today. And thank you, Matt, for leading this talk. Thank you, Parker. Yeah, so I'll just echo uh, what Parker said. We're very lucky to have Andrew joining us here. Um, if we let him run, most of us will not understand what he's talking about. Uh, so we will try and bring it back uh, and keep it uh, accessible. Um, I guess a good place to start is, how, how long have you uh, been working in the open source space for? So in the open source space, um, yeah. beyond Bitcoin, I've been doing, I think, public open source work since I was 12, 10, 11 or 12, um, so about 20 years. Um, originally, I think the first public open source um, tool that I worked on was something called PCB, which is what it sounds like, it's a printed circuit board editor. Uh, it was part of the, the GEDA, which is a GNU electronic design apps, something like that. Um, and I spent a summer working on just improving the UI, um, changing their units from, I think, one hundredth of a millimeter to nanometers so you could do more precise things when you were working in metric and things like that. Um, and before that, I had been doing some, like, my own kind of hobby projects. Uh, but back then, I didn't have, like, a, an internet connection at home, uh, at least not all the time. I think when my parents weren't on the phone, then I could connect to the internet. So it wasn't so easy. It wasn't so easy to be doing open source stuff. I got into Bitcoin, though, um, as kind of a continuation of that. In late 2011, somebody on Slashdot, I mean, this was like the very end of Slashdot, I think, was to kind of pump me into the Bitcoin space. Somebody was posting something wrong about Bitcoin, and I don't remember what it was. I think at the time there was a meme that the way the Bitcoin worked, right, is that you would grind, you would find these, these hashes, right, that was mining was, and then you would trade the hash values somehow, right? You would like, I don't know, put them in a secret envelope and I don't know. I mean, it didn't make sense, right? So I followed the slash daughter who was, who was making this claim to Bitcoin.org to try to understand how all these idiots trading caches thought that they were going to make some sort of financial system out of it. And as it turned out, their uh, Bitcoin does not work by people trading hashes. And from Bitcoin.org, I, I wound up uh, on IRC. And I was able to meet, I was very fortunate to show up on IRC at this time in late 2011, early 2012. At that time, Mt. Gox was in full swing. Um, I think the price had just crashed from $30 down to like $15. Uh, so it was a steal, right? I could get in at half price. And, um, and of course, it, it continued down to like two or three. Um, and then it was going to zero, so I sold everything. No, not quite, not quite, but close. So. I was very fortunate at that time, it was very early days, sort of the only way that you could get into Bitcoin was something like that. There were sort of two big ways that I was familiar with, maybe three, but I mean the, the big ways were either you were a developer, like a cryptographer or a hobbyist or somebody who thought it was just a neat technical system, or you had heard of the Silk Road and it was a way to buy drugs, basically, is what you'd come in. And, and there were, I guess the third way was the Ron Paul people, the kind of libertarian, like hard money kind of set of people. But at that time, it was difficult to sell Bitcoin to a lot of the, the hard money people, to the Mises Institute, for example, famously did, did have a very negative view of Bitcoin. And this came from sort of an intuition that if something's on a computer, then it can't be hard money, right? Like, like computer money is the opposite of hard money. And a theme that we've seen throughout this day, right, is that for the most part, in everything except for Bitcoin, that intuition is true. As we move our ordinary money onto computers, we're finding we're exposing ourselves to censorship and, uh, and things of that nature. But with Bitcoin, you don't, which is very surprising. And like, it's not obvious that that should even be possible, right? Because as silly as this idea was that Bitcoin was trading hash values, which is what people were saying back then, um, there have been a lot of good memes about Bitcoin, but that, that one was one of the oldest and, and funnier ones. It's difficult to think like, how else could it work, right? And now I think we've, we've as, a, as a community, we've started to develop some more intuition about how digital signatures work and the notion of signing transactions and transactions having inputs and outputs and so on. But it very quickly becomes very technical still. 
And this idea that you could have money that somehow is on a computer and you spend the money by creating data and transmitting it over public networks that are like not only being wiretapped at every possible opportunity, but in the end, the data goes onto a public blockchain, which is then replicated tens of thousands of times across the world and will be stored until long after everyone in this room is dead. It's surprising that you could transfer money that way, that somebody couldn't just download the blockchain and just copy all your coins off and, and run laughing. And so moving back to, to the open source world, I, I showed up on IRC. At the time, everybody on IRC, actually still everybody on IRC, is kind of a, a crazy like gray beard developer kind of type. And the Bitcoin community was fairly small and everybody was very welcoming. And at that time in my life, I, I was again very fortunate in the timing I was transitioning into graduate school. I, I was actually moving here to Austin uh, to, to start a math PhD program here at UT. And the first couple years of a math PhD program, I would say, are probably the easiest thing that anybody could possibly do. It was just like a free ride. It was great. They, uh, they gave me $20,000 a year to just move to Austin and party all the time. And all I had to do was like write some tests every three or four months. And, uh, and that's cool. And then, you know, eventually they say like, you know, you should get a supervisor and you should have a thesis topic and all this stuff. And at that point I left, but they, um, <laughs> at the time it was just like, it was great. I, I had very little responsibility. I had nobody, no deadlines, no anything. And at the time I showed up on IRC and there were people like Greg Maxwell there and Peter Woola and Matt Corallo who are all still, still around by the way, although they're, they're, some of them are less public than they have been in the past. And they said, hey, there's this thing called the ePrint Archive, which is a place where cryptographers post their papers that they're working on prior to going through the peer review and being published and stuff. And they said, hey, Andrew, like, maybe try reading these papers and try to understand this, this Bitcoin stuff. where We have this ECDSA signature scheme, and there's this other scheme called Schnorr that we think might be better for various reasons. Maybe we can investigate that kind of thing. And it's funny here to be, be talking about this in 2022, and I guess like seven or eight later, we seven or eight years later, we finally did get Schnorr into Bitcoin. But we were talking about it back then. We were talking about Snarks uh, back then. There was a paper in late 2013 called Snarks for C uh, by like eight different uh, authors. Probably the most famous one in this room would be Ellie Ben Sasson, who's the CEO of Starkware. And it was a small community of people who were doing open source development, who were reading open access literature, cryptographic literature, and the idea to me that you could just download like the things that academics were doing and you could see what was happening in this intellectual development of, uh, of the system of the whole field of cryptography was very exciting and eye-opening, right? Like you don't need academic access to get access to the ePrint archive. You don't need to be a cryptographer to read these papers. Um, there is some, some sort of basic math literacy you need, but you can get that from the internet as well. You don't need to go through a system. There's no, no gates that... Uh, uh, you're being kept out of. There is if you want credentials, perhaps, but that's not what you needed to do Bitcoin. You didn't need any credentials. You still don't need any credentials. It's very much an open access system where as long as you can be, you know, kind of kind of reasonably sociable and, and get along with people um, and not show up and start fights and, and fool around on Twitter all day, then you can get stuff done, right? People will recognize that, that you know what you're talking about or don't, and they're very helpful. They're very friendly. They'll, they'll help you to ramp up. And so I showed up in the Bitcoin world. I had a, a bit of math experience, a bit of crypto experience. Like I, I was sort of primed to be working on this kind of stuff and a fair bit of open source experience at that time. I'd done a lot of public development and public projects. I was familiar with the process of like writing code and asking people to read it and, and going through iterations and review and people saying mean things to you and people asking you to rewrite things that you'd put weeks of um, your blood and sweat into. And... So I, I was okay with that. And from there, there was sort of a natural, a natural thing. I would, I would suggest that Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin Core, is not the friendliest of open source projects uh, to join. It's very high friction because Bitcoin Core has consensus code in it, right? Like it's really, and a consensus code for now, like a multi-hundred billion dollar system is really kind of mind-blowing. But at the time, it was a much smaller system, first of all. And we didn't understand consensus as well as we do now. Um, there's an interesting uh, historical tidbit. If you look for the word soft fork on Bitcoin talk, you'll find that the first use of that term, I believe dates to 2012, or 
or so, uh, around the same time that the idea of mining pools showed up. Um, and other things that we take for granted, like very old things. But actually, Bitcoin had been going for several years. There were big exchanges running. And at the time, as a community, we didn't understand the notion of uh, hard forks and soft forks and how consensus worked and, and things like that. Um, it was a very, very uh, early Wild West day. Like even, even for Bitcoin, like this was a Wild West. This was pretty crazy. And secondly, as much as Bitcoin Core is, and at the time it was just called Bitcoin, um, it was a very controversial name change for, for reasons I'm not going to go into. Um, I gravitated more towards the crypto side of things. And the cryptography behind Bitcoin is actually done in a separate software library called libsecp256k1. And I remember Greg Maxwell, who at the time was just like the god of Bitcoin. And, and to this day, actually, if there's one person in the world who's responsible for Bitcoin existing and surviving uh, and thriving the way that it has, it will be Greg Maxwell. Um, I was talking to him on IRC, because he's, he's actually pretty easy to talk to on IRC. And he suggested that I work on an ARM assembly implementation of some crypto algorithm, right? Some like very obscure technical thing. And I was kind of shocked that Greg Maxwell would think that I could do something like that, right? Like it's just like I was kind of very flattered. And, and even though I wasn't, um, I had a little bit of experience doing stuff like that. It was with ARM assembly and crypto and stuff. I thought, wow, like I should go do that. And so I spent some time trying to do, and in, in the end, I didn't actually succeed at that. To this day, I have not touched the ARM assembly code in libsecp. But by doing that, I learned about how the library worked. I learned the, uh, who the different developers were. I learned how to interact with them. And between that and my reading of stuff on the ePrint archive, I was then able to become a, crypto, um, a contributor to the libsecp library, which does all of the crypto. And eventually I became a maintainer, actually. For several years, I was one of the persons uh, who had merge access to, to that library. And I remember when this first happened, I was very scared. Bitcoin at the time had a market cap, maybe a billion dollars uh, around this time, I think, maybe, maybe two or three billion dollars. And the cryptography underlying it, everything in Bitcoin is cryptography somehow, but there's a core of it that's like, is like hard cryptography, is, is like pure cryptography. I, I don't know what the right word is, but it's the signatures, right? It's the stuff that deals with secret keys and with public keys, where if those keys are leaked or lost or something, then all the money is gone forever. And there are ways, there are very subtle ways that you can lose key material. Whenever you have computers working with secret key material, that's a very dangerous and fragile situation. It's, it's really incredible that cryptography works at all, right? Because you have all these public networks, you have these public logs, you have everything. Everything can be seen. So how can you take a secret key, you put this into some sort of computer system, it takes that secret key and does something with it, and it outputs something that looks, you know, random is somehow derived from that key in a way that you can verify, because you can verify the signatures and stuff, but somehow it doesn't reveal anything about the key. And there is a lot of, like, it really is dancing a fine line. The way that it works, right, is the computer needs to generate a second ephemeral key, and then it turns out that if you mix two uniformly random things together, the output will be uniformly random. Sorry. If you mix a uniformly random thing and anything else together, the result will be uniformly random. So there's a sense in which you can erase data by mixing it with uniform randomness. And that's what happens as part of the signature process. But if you mess up and you don't use quite uniform enough randomness, right, if you use like too many one bits or whatever, then it's not uniform and you don't erase all the secret key data and then your keys get leaked. And in fact, this has happened on the real network. So I was working on the library that was used in Bitcoin Core, or Bitcoin at the time. And this was the most popularly used library. On the verification side, it is like the, by far the most popular. It's, it's the library that's in the reference implementation, right? On the reference Bitcoin node. And this library is actually used inside of a lot of hardware wallets. It's used in all of the major Ethereum node implementations. It's used in wallets for that. It's used in like all over the place, even in non cryptocurrency applications. It's a very widely used library. And if the code that I was writing or reviewing or merging was somehow wrong, then there was potentially billions of dollars that could just go away. And at the time I was, you know, in my early 20s, I was like screwing around, like doing some sort of immigration scam uh, with the UT here so that I could fool around and, you know, play the piano and drink beer all the time. And I had this multi-billion dollar system that somehow depended, you know, I, I think they were safeguards in retrospect. But certainly it felt at the time like it depended on me not doing anything too reckless. And 
this was a very strange experience. It was a very strange phenomenon, really. Like at the time, and, and now Bitcoin is much bigger and there are many more stakeholders. And, and in many ways, it's not the Wild West. And there really are safeguards, right? At this point, like I actually probably couldn't screw up the system, even if I tried. But at the time, maybe I could have. And the idea that I could do that, despite not being credentialed in any real way, um, I was just a student who, in, you know, in the, the professional world, certainly in software development and, and in cryptography, um, being a student is not a good thing, right? People are very distrustful of students writing <laughs> cryptography code uh, with good reason. It was cool that I could just walk in and sort of do that. Um, and so that was, that was probably 2013, 2014, and I, I continued to, to ride that out pretty much to this day. Um, in 2014, there was a company called Blockstream that started. Um, and they're, they're reasonably well known, certainly on the technical side of things. A lot of people have heard of Blockstream and outside of the, the technical sphere or maybe not as well known, but they were at the time in late 2014 and, and a project by a bunch of people basically on IRC. We had a couple like VCU, like California people. I didn't know where they came from and they're not, they're not there anymore. Um, who showed up and kind of facilitated things and would buy us flights and, and do all sorts of cool stuff. But what it felt like to me and what it was really was me and a bunch of people in IRC who were able somehow to form a company around all this experimental kind of crypto stuff that we were doing basically in our spare time for fun. And for me, it meant that I could stay in Austin, right? I no longer had to be going, like, I, I had a student visa at the time with UT, and that was really why I was still in that PhD program. And I was able to drop that and switch to a work visa and stay in Austin, and that was cool. But it was also cool that we were making money, um, or at least raising money, doing um, cryptography, doing, like, experimental, doing experimental, like, novel cryptocurrency research, that cryptocurrency research wasn't even really a thing at that time outside of, outside of us and a couple other similar groups. And so I've continued basically in, in that vein over the last uh, six or eight years pretty much since Blockstream's been formed. And at this point, I, I'm the director of research at Blockstream. I run a, a team of researchers. For a little while, we were kind of the only team uh, in town, but now there are many, which is super cool to see. Uh, Chainco Labs also funds a lot of Bitcoin development, and they, they partially fund the Bitcoin Optech newsletter and, and all sorts of outreach associated to that. Um, there's Brink, which is a company, Mike Schmidt, who, who lives here in Austin, although he's, he's not here. He lives outside Austin. You know? No, I shouldn't point in what direction, but, you know, he's around. Um, and uh, and there's, there's Block, of course, um, which was Square Crypto until recently, right? There's, there's all these different groups who are doing uh, Bitcoin research as well as stakeholders, you know, exchanges and stuff, funding research, like paying for core developers to work and, and contributing to this open source world. And this is a fascinating thing to see. As, aside from just the fascination in Bitcoin itself, from the open source perspective, there's been forever, open source has been around forever. It's, it's been around in some form or other, probably since the, the 70s, I think it sort of came in as an idea. And before that, actually, everything was like, nobody even thought about trying to monetize source code. Um, and then when people did, open source was right there to say, well, you know, maybe we could do that without trapping people and trying to control access to information and like somehow forming a censorship-based monetization model. So open source has been around forever and, and open source led to, to many things that we know and love, right? The Linux uh, operating system, which is used in, in half the phones that are out there, as well as like 80% of all the servers and stuff out there. And all over the internet, right? The, the decoders that show you JPEGs and GIFs and the original web browsers and, and actually all current web browsers are all open source. Um, it's just everywhere. And historically, there was no way to monetize this. There was this, this horrible phenomenon where people would invent groundbreaking critical things. It's actually there's an XKCD about this. People who, who would write code that would then become like a foundational critical component of the infrastructure of the modern world and they would be basically begging for donations on the internet. Or they would be making like $40,000 a year because some random software company was willing to hire them in, the, in the, like whatever part of Oklahoma that they lived in and stuff like that. And, and they were doing like really critical stuff that's leading to trillions of dollars of wealth creation in other parts of the industry, but they personally don't see a dime of that. And in the Bitcoin space, we are very fortunate in that there is a lot of money kind of by definition in the Bitcoin space. And more broadly, geopolitically, there's a lot of money in cryptography. There's a lot of money in computer security. 
and it's possible to get a very high paying job doing Bitcoin development. And if you were here around in the, the very early days of Bitcoin as well, it's also possible to make a non-trivial amount of money by just owning some Bitcoin and holding on to it. Although I should, I should maybe clarify, because there's a, a meme out there, one of the many, many ideas that people have about Bitcoin is that all the OG developers have just like billions of dollars or whatever. And this is actually not true for a couple of reasons. And I'm obviously, that's, I have a very self-serving motivation in saying this to everybody. But it is legitimately a, a falsehood that um, Bitcoin OGs all have tremendous piles of money. One reason is that they, like many people, uh, after buying Bitcoin and seeing it go up 10x, right, from 15 cents to a buck 50, just like sold it all and said like, all right, you know, I, I can buy a car now. Another reason is though, at the time, it seemed like a really experimental kind of sketchy system that was going to fall over any day. And it really did for a very long time, like longer than, than anyone would expect. I would say personally that it was maybe like 2016 or 2017 before I thought that maybe the system could, could maybe keep its own. Um, that there wasn't going to be some break in SHA-2 or like the mining incentives would turn out not to work or, you know, who knows, maybe the crypto would be broken in some way or maybe just like network systems, um, maybe it couldn't handle partitioning or maybe there'd be a fork or, um, or whatever. And, um, and so the people who were closest to the system really building it had a much clearer idea of the fragility of the system and the inherent fragility of cryptography, of, of how narrow a dance all of this code was doing to work with secret key data to do meaningful things. And so the people who were building the system and working on it the hardest were probably the most suspicious of it um, beyond the people who would like look at it once and walk away, of course. And then finally, like as a more general thing, it's good not to, uh, to, uh, to invest too heavily in something that your career already invests in, right? We, we learned that from Enron, but it's a general thing, right? That just your, your personal, what you're good at is itself a form of investment. So by, Diverse, like diversification mandates that you probably shouldn't have all your actual money in something that your career also depends on. Because that way, you know, the, you, well, you have some protection against one or both of those. Sorry, you have some protection against one of those, not both going away. And, uh, and if instead you put all of your chips where, where, um, where your employment prospects are, you know, that's, that's a very risky thing to do. So, uh, so for that reason, I mean, a few people did get very rich, and I'm not going to say who, um, but, you know, a few people did, but for the most part, developers in the Bitcoin space were not able to just like buy 10,000 coins back when they were worth 50 cents and, and have held on to them today. But what we were able to do is form an industry, a thriving industry with a lot of economic activity happening in it, where it's possible as an open source developer to be well paid and well respected. And that's a very novel thing in the history of open source and in the history of development. And it's a very precious thing. Like, and and I, again, obviously, this is very self-serving. It's precious that I get paid so much, isn't it? <laughs> but what I mean is, historically, open source, I guess I, I haven't, I realize I haven't defined open source, but it's the idea that, that you can publish code and anybody can show up and contribute to it, right? And that the code is public, you can vet it, you can verify it. Um, if you think there's something suspicious about it, you can read it and, and assure yourself that there's not, or there is. Um, if you want to contribute to it, if it's broken, you can fix it, you can submit changes, people will take it, and, and you know, everybody can share. And historically, there hasn't been any model to, to make that sustainable economically, other than charity, basically. So for example, the Linux operating system for a long time, basically like IBM was paying a couple developers to do it. Um, and now there are you know, probably a couple dozen companies like IBM paying Linux kernel developers but they're doing it because, you know, it's one or two employees on like a, you know, 100,000 person payroll. So it's fine. It's not very much money. And their business does kind of depend on Linux continuing, but it's just sort of a, a, a charitable thing. And that works for Linux because Linux is huge and important, but it doesn't work for a lot of smaller projects that wind up being done by individuals in their spare time. So now it's personal charity, right? It's people just doing a lot of these projects out of a labor of love. And it's very cool that for something like Bitcoin, which for a lot of us was a labor of love. We're able to be paid for that and, and, and it's, uh, we're able to do it in a financially sustainable way. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, dude, you fucking killed it. Uh, <laughs> you have two minutes left. There's two minutes left.
Cool. So I, I think I'll cede my last two minutes um, then if it's really two minutes. So thank you all for listening. Um, <laughs>